<clears throat> well, hello everyone. I hope you're doing okay. I have to <laughs> re-record this lecture. Um, I didn't, luckily I didn't get too far into it, but I did give some misleading information that would have caused unending confusion. Okay, so I just want to point out where we are at. Um, remember, we're going back to MindTap assignments being due on Wednesday, so just be aware of that. Uh, you know, they're covering the chapter that we're usually on. Uh, so the, the next one will be due um, next Wednesday at uh, by 11.59 p.m. Then on Friday, two weeks from today, we have the first exam. Um, we will have an exam you will get the study guide a week from today on uh, Friday. So, okay, so where are we going between now and the exam? Uh, first of all, what's gonna be on the exam? All the information up to where, we've, where we're at today. So basically chapters one, 12, 13, uh, and 14. And uh, the accompanying lectures. The exam will be, uh, the exam will be about uh, 40 questions, multiple choice, um, <clears throat> mostly definitional, and I'll talk about this more <clears throat> in, uh, in a future lecture. So then next week I will kind of finish up a few things about science and technology uh, and the environment and kind of <laughs> bring those subjects together kind of preparing us then for for when we when we finish the uh, exam and we move into talking about war and terrorism uh, which will be pretty expansive topics um, I will also not possibly next week or the 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 week after the week of the exam um, I'll be recording one lecture on the final project and public organizations versus private organizations and I, you're free to watch that you know and when you want to um you can watch that after the exam if you like because none of that information will be uh, on the exam it's more for the final project as i said let's see so next week standard um discussions the following week though and i'll I'll make this clear again in an announcement. Uh, there won't be, there won't be packed back discussions. Uh, there won't be, a, <laughs> there won't be a packed back discussion on the day that we that I talk about public and private organizations, which will probably be the Monday before the exam, and then that Wednesday before the exam. So that is February the twenty fourth, I believe. Um, we will have an optional exam review session. So I'll send out a Zoom link, and then you can uh, decide to join or not. And I'll just basically field questions that that you may have. <clears throat> so I think that's all I have right now. As I said, this following week is going to combine science and environment and technology um, a little bit and the material, well, I'll just wait till we get there. <laughs> okay, so today's lecture may be a, a little bit shorter, um, but, or maybe not so much. We'll see. Anyway, I should get moving on it so we can see how short it will be. All right, so first of all, I think one of the things that's important to understand. Give me back where I'm going. Okay. So if you remember, I talked about this Anthropocene Alerts by a guy named Timothy Luke. He also, back in the 1980s, wrote a book called Screens of Power, where you sort of recognized already uh, that computers and televisions and uh, cameras were going to create new power dynamics in society. So I, I really appreciate his work because he's a very forward, uh, forward thinker. Um, <clears throat> messing up my notes okay all right sorry I had to fix something so uh, I'm back now okay so anyway moving on then we had been we left off we were talking about Shoshana Zuboff uh, if you haven't watched that video 
with her about Pokemon Go, I would highly recommend it. Uh, it's embedded in the lecture. So remember, she's looking at this new type of uh, surveillance. She calls it surveillance capitalism. She also uses the term instrumentarianism, uh, particularly to uh, describe the way in which China uses some of these systems, the way that governments use these systems, um, as opposed to, say, companies like, like Google. And she, what she did, I think, is what what she did is that's really, I think, revolutionary is she really breaks down <clears throat> this new information economy in, the, in a similar way that Marx did with capitalism. Now, Marx got a lot of things wrong about capitalism, but actually his analysis of 19th century capitalism is fairly accurate and what he did that was revolutionary in terms of you know analysis was to kind of break apart okay the laborers the owners the means of production where surplus value comes uh you know, is created and how that relates to profit and investment uh, and so on so we kind of you know, he kind of broke it all down. So Zuboff does the something similar with this new information economy. So she describes this behavioral value reinvestment cycle. This is probably what most of us know if we know anything about, uh, you know, search engines and the way that they use our data. So here we are, the user, the render behavior, you know, getting on, I'm going to use Google as, an, <clears throat> as a good example. Uh, you know, you're getting on Google, you're searching for things, you know, places to eat. And so that's behavioral data that goes through analytics, algorithms, and so on that, you know, because, you know, they're growing on each other, they, that leads to service improvements, which then leads to a better experience for the user. Uh, so next, the next user will then uh, get even better uh, information. Now, she kind of breaks down like how this system changed from just you know being about improving searches because remember here google we're primarily talking about them improving the search quality so now that's changed though it's gone from improving search quality to improving the ability of advertisers to target micro target uh, individual users so now this behavioral data that uh, comes about beyond just, you know, what's needed for improving the uh, search quality is constituted as behavioral surplus. So basically you can think of it like this, you know, you're searching on stuff on Google, but you're also playing videos on uh, YouTube that don't really have anything to do with what you're looking up on Google, you know, restaurants or something like that. But, you know, Google is using that information like, oh, so they like this type of music and this type of food. And, you know, maybe you can infer something from that and let some advertisers know and they can target specific musical restaurants or something. Um, so anyway, Google then noticed in 2002 during this game called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? It was a game show on uh, on TV. There was a question. The answer was Carol Brady. And there's this huge search, a uh, huge spike in searches for Carol Brady. That's when Google thought, hmm, you know, we can make a lot of money um, if we were to sell advertisers our ability to predict user behavior, kind of like the Pokemon Go uh, that we saw in the real world this is, you know, the, the, the surveillance capital model where it started, Pokemon Go, that's, you know, applied to the real world. So then she develops this other cycle. So remember, uh, here you've got that initial cycle that I talked about on the other slide. But here's the other, you know, the new cycle of surveillance capitalism, um, where basically you get rendered behavior, you know, what is it that people are you know, an individual is doing online, you get all the surplus data, you know, other things they're searching for, music they're listening to, videos they're watching, shows uh, they're, they're watching and so on. And then you get various other companies and so on that are trying to uh, get in there. And this goes to helping the prediction, you know, trying to do a better job of predicting uh, user behavior. Then you develop markets for that and companies can then, you know, you know buy, you know, essentially purchase um, services from Google and that sort of thing. Then the company Google, they get their own revenues from, you know, this, <laughs> this the system of prediction and so on, which they can use to uh, improve their ability to further predict our behavior. So that's, you know, kind of a, a it's a, that's the other cycle, the one that 
I don't think people are really aware of yet. You know, I think we're all pretty aware that, you know, Google will, you know, take our data and improve its search quality. Now I think more people are becoming aware of, you know, they're doing it and targeting ads toward us, but maybe people aren't aware of the sort of, you know, the, the process itself. <clears throat> One more little drawing here. <clears throat> So if you think of it like a snowball, a snowball coming down a, um, you know, down a, down a hill, she's got it broken down here, you know, economies of scale, scope, and action, basically surveillance, capitalism's master motion is the accumulation of new sources of behavioral surplus with more predictive power. The goal is predictions comparable to guaranteed outcomes in real life behavior. Extraction begins online, but the prediction imperative increases the momentum driving extraction toward new sources in the real world. So here you've got the online world, um, extraction of predictive behavior, online world, pretty soon you've got uh, physical world behavior, and you know, then you've got, um, you know, modified human behavior as a result of what they're doing online, which, you know, we're all aware of now. I think what's what's alarming is how fast this this process has happened. I mean, the internet has only been commercial since 1993. Uh, you know, Facebook has been around since 2004. The smartphone 2007. Um, you know, but these systems, you know, have 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 have, have moved quite quite rapidly, <clears throat> and many of us are. Whoops are spending a lot of time in front of screens. You can look at this and, you know, see where the average is in terms of uh, where people are spending time on social media, how much time, uh, and, and so on. Um, America is above the average, but not terribly above above the average, uh, which is kind of surprising. I kind of would have thought Americans would have been more uh, bigger social media, media users. There are other ways of thinking about this and trying to figure out maybe ways in which to better the world as a result of all of this. One interesting approach, some of you who are interested in sort of auction economics or economics in general and, you know, computational or social science and <laughs> all of this stuff, uh, we might want to check out this book, Radical Markets, Uprooting Capitalism and Democracy for a Just Society. So what they say is that, you know, they kind of agree with, you know, Zuboff and her surveillance capitalism model for the most part. And what they point out, though, is that, you know, what she's calling surplus data and some of this, that's labor. We should think of that as labor. I mean, that's, you know, that's your effort that you're putting in, you're typing in those searches, you know, and watching those videos and so on. Um, but right now, Google and other companies basically can hoard all that and use it for free. And so they're saying, you know, you should actually be able to, they should be paying you for that data, um, uh, essentially. Here's they make a lot of a lot of very uh, interesting arguments. So one of the more controversial ones is that property, private property, is a monopoly and therefore it violates free markets, which is not something you hear very often. Usually you hear that private property is a precondition for free markets, not a violation of free markets. So their argument is basically this idea that uh, kind of like the neo-feudalism that property especially you know entrenches people um into wealthy positions into uh wealthy yeah into into a into a wealthy aristocracy essentially and that because of that you can't actually have a good free market the if you're familiar, there's a an economist named Henry George who, who talked about this quite a bit back in the 1800s. Who was saying, you know, we got to do something about we, how we manage property and land uh, because it's completely in violation of this, you know, free market system we talk about using. Um, so that's what I found in my own research as well, uh, both in terms of my research on land use and development, as well as my research on uh, war and conflict, sometimes over land itself. So anyway, um, interesting argument there. They also say, you know, people could get credits for voting and then they could exchange those credits. Uh, so again, uh, interesting, interesting arguments there, kind of, they have, their systems are based on uh, auction economics. I'm not going to 
go into this in, in a lot of detail, just kind of uh, show this uh, to you and also let you know that this is what a lot of people are thinking about right now. So, you know, this may not be what you're learning in, you know, Econ 101, but maybe in Econ something else or other, uh, you know, you'll be learning, you know, the, the top minds are thinking about this stuff essentially and, you know, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, all of that. Uh, Shoshana Zuboff, she's read this book, their, their work. She's skeptical. She does not. She just thinks that this is going to give more power, uh, to the tech companies, um, that if you, that basically you want to spend less time, uh, on, on, uh, technological devices and, and so on. So anyway, uh, different perspectives there. Well, we can use technology for a number of good things. Uh, one thing we should be doing in the United States, but have mm, completely failed at, is contact tracing to find out who who has coronavirus, who they've been in contact with, uh, and so on. You know, there there was a lot of optimism, I, I should say, a few months ago that or a few months, many months ago, um, that, you know, we could possibly set up a system of contact tracing if we started early, as in like last April. Um, by May, it was pretty clear that we wouldn't be able to do that. I'll wait to go into coronavirus uh, later in our, in our government's response. Uh, but basically, we have the technology that we could really, if we, if, you know, Americans would be a little bit more communitarian, less libertarian for uh, maybe a few months and, you know, develop some sort of uh, way of contact tracing and monitoring our, our behavior and being mindful of it and so on. Uh, we could tackle coronavirus more successfully or like like many other countries have. Um, but I'm, I just don't know if I see that happening. So one thing that, you know, I see a lot in the message boards are, you know, is social media a good thing? Is technology a good thing? I would kind of veer away from asking if technology is a good thing because, you know, technology is, you know, learning how to make fire and, uh, you know, the wheel and um, we're always using technology, but it's sort of, you know, how we use it, what technologies we use and so on. And social media as well. You know, there are good and bad cases for social media. Um, as I said, I met my wife on social media, so I'm not, a, <laughs> not completely opposed to it. Uh, I stay in contact with a lot of family. I also think it's destroying the world, so, you know, it kind of goes both ways. Um, there's a fantastic article or edition of The Atlantic that came out in December of 2019 called How to Stop a Civil War with some very, very interesting articles in it. And some of these next few slides draw from that. So some important events that happened in social media history. 2009, the retweet button is added to Twitter. So all of a sudden you get a tweet, uh, you get to, you know, share other people's clever tweets, um, or you can disparage them or, you know, whatever it might be. So that's huge, huge change in people's behavior uh, using Twitter. Basically means that one person's tweet could then be sent to millions and tens and billions of people and so on. 2012, the share button added in Facebook, which also meant that a lot of news stories and so on also had the share button. So there then, you know, again, you could share information or misinformation as, as we have learned. Now, you know, these things started with not, <laughs> these things started because the tech oligarchs are fairly naive about certain aspects of human behavior. Um, they didn't seem to realize the the political consequences or they had in my view a very naive belief that it was just going to be like a um public forum and you know the 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 best arguments would win and that sort of thing it was very sort of utopian idea of public discussion on social media but these companies are companies of surveillance capitalism uh they are there to make money they're not public forums they are trying to ultimately uh micro target uh people for advertisers that means classifying people putting people in sort of you know categories and then you know bombarding those categories with uh with various messages political cultural commercial whatever they might be 
So this then leads to people being siloed off, um, people being stuck in their own echo chambers. Pretty soon you have, I mean, I noticed this on my Facebook feed where, you know, a friend of mine who has a doctor from Harvard is like arguing about race or gender or something with a friend of mine who didn't graduate high school. And it's just, you know, the, the, platform was not designed for thoughtful, respectful discussion. Uh, you know, neither of these platforms were. I mean, our societies are, for various reasons, American society is pretty cynical. Uh, and you see this in, in the, in social media discourse quite a bit. Now, when we look at, you know, what leads people to share stuff. There's a study done uh, by researchers at NYU where they looked at half a million tweets and found that basically each moral or emotional word increased its virality by 20%, meaning uh, it spread more. So if they were saying something like, you know, um, you know, I strongly oppose the Trump administration's policies on coronavirus, you know, that's probably not strong enough, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I fucking hate the Trump administration's policies on coronavirus. It's that sort of thing that that would have been, you know, that would have been more likely to be shared than, say, a thoughtful critique of, uh, say, the Trump administration's policies on coronavirus or whatever it might be. Um, you know, pick your issue. Uh, Facebook, the same thing. Basically, the more that you're, uh, you know, kind of argumentative and so on, the more likely you are likely to be liked and shared and uh, that sort of thing. I, <clears throat> excuse me. Facebook is kind of interesting. Well, we'll get there. So when we look at this, though, this leads to this leads to mob behavior, first online and then as we see offline as well. So <clears throat> Chris Weatherall, he's one of the engineers at Twitter who designed the retweet button, totally regrets it. I uh, think that's one of the worst things that he ever did. Uh, when he start, first started to see what was happening in terms of sort of the mob behavior, he said, we may have just handed a four-year-old a loaded weapon. Um, and really in 2013, 2014, we started to see these Twitter mobs just descend on people uh, for various reasons. Sometimes it was Gamergate, so a bunch of kind of sexist men attacking female bloggers, um, or people that would say something that does not, you know, align with uh, you know, various orthodoxies on um, gender pronouns or whatever it might be. You know, you'd see a huge Twitter mob uh, go after people for various things. So we see this this happening, and this has become now a fact of our uh, political and our public life, which is um, which I think is a bad thing. Um, I have been on Twitter and got off Twitter a few times. I can't remember if I have an account now. I think I do. Um, or maybe I deleted it. I don't know. I, I get on just because I'm interested in what some people have to say. Um, but then I always end up deleting my account just because I hate. I just, uh, yeah, anyway. I don't want to, to, to become part of a mob. Now, as you've seen, these companies are incredibly important for politics. This was from long ago in the election of 2015, 2016. Uh, this company, Cambridge Analytica, you may be familiar with them. They sort of hoovered up about 50 million uh, users data on, on, uh, on Facebook and started micro-targeting for the Trump campaign. They're a company that has done stuff for you know, like The Economist and various, uh, you know, other organizations. So they're not necessarily a political organization, um, but they were sort of hired by uh, the Trump campaign in 2016. And they would send out these sort of little personality quizzes to people. And based upon how they would answer them, then they would send them uh, advertisements, you know, political campaign uh, stuff based upon their personalities. And so they were doing this with a very fine-tuned degree of precision, looking at people in small towns in Pennsylvania uh, and, and so on. So um, really kind of a, a, a fascinating thing. Now, <laughs> we'll get into this uh, later on in this class, but I, um, now seems like a good time to at least begin it, introducing it. You may have heard of this little group, a little uh, thing called QAnon. Uh, so QAnon, as I said, I'm not going to go into this in great detail right now. I'll actually be talking about that, I believe, next week. 
yeah, next week and maybe the following week too, a little bit. Um, but QAnon is, is, is again, it's, it's, it, it's a classic cult. Um, you know, I don't have the information in front of me, but, you know, the sociology of cults and everything, like, this is a, a good example. Except it's very different because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's online. There's no clear leadership, which is usually, usually, uh, the opposite of a cult. Usually, you know, a cult has a cult leader. You could argue that Trump is sort of the cult leader, but, he doesn't necessarily lead them, lead, you know, the people that, that, that follow this. Um, but they do sort of worship him in a sort of religious, almost a, a, a religious sort of way. But we know that this really, you know, took off as a result of, of, uh, of Facebook. And it's really, what I think is, is quite alarming is just how rapidly it has kind of taken over um the the republican party and uh, you know i th I, th I think in the coming years you're going, you're going to see a huge split uh, within the Republican Party. You're going to have probably another one group that's more traditionally conservative and one group that's more you know the QAnon Trump more extreme right wing. Um, and I should say that I think the same thing as something similar will probably happen to the Democratic Party, but maybe in a, a, f a few years later. Um, I could be completely wrong, though, you know, so, um, but anyway, th we do know that the Republican Party now um, has increasingly, you know, dove into conspiracy theories. And the conspiracy theories about QAnon, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of them, you know, you can <laughs> dive into that stuff if you want. I have a colleague, a friend, actually a friend I've known most of my life. Uh, he works at a university in Europe and he got a big grant a few months ago to study uh, conspiracy theories that have come about during the coronavirus age. And I was like, you're, you've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, his report won't be ready for a couple of years. And, uh, but anyway, so I'll be anxious, anxious to read that. But QAnon, I mean, what is so fascinating, and this could only happen with the internet, is how dramatically and how fastly it has, has grown. So this was just a year ago, like almost a, exactly a year ago. Back in February 2018, remember those days? I mean, 2020. Oh, when we, uh, you know, there's this thing called coronavirus that was doing something in uh, parts of the world, but Americans were basically, you know, looking forward to looking forward to their the rest of their year. So this is the percentage of Americans who say they've heard nothing at all about QAnon. <laughs> So a year ago, 76% say they had heard nothing at all. Uh, only 20% say they had heard a little. Uh, only 3% said they had heard a lot. I would be in that a little category. I knew that they were in existence. Um, you know, I was kind of following them. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of groups that were, you know, kind of forming and merging at, at that time. Um, and it seemed almost so, outlandish to be you know, to grow too big you know it just seemed you know this idea that all these hollywood uh, celebrities and people in the democratic party are have these pedophile rings and uh things like this i'm not saying there aren't sex trafficking rings but the idea that donald trump is the one that's uh, in there you know fighting all this you know, that just sounds <laughs> to me that sounds a, a little bit naive about how these things work anyway so most people hadn't heard about it a year ago. So here we're getting closer to now. You're going from then to August and September, basically through the fall. Uh, now people have heard about it, you know. Um, a lot of Democrats have heard about it. In fact, you get actually more Democrats who, who, who have heard about it, probably because they're like, what is this thing, new thing uh, now? 47% of all U.S. adults. So remember, it was 76% uh, a year ago. By the fall, you know, um, almost half of Americans had heard of it. And now this is basically, this was, you know, this is, I guess, about that same time uh, in October. In terms of some of their their claims, most Democrats, 63%, see them as being uh, very somewhat inaccurate. 48% um, say that they're, you know, very somewhat inaccurate of total U.S. adults, 
28% saying they don't know, probably a large percent who just don't know much about QAnon. Uh, 24%, you know, a quarter of the population who do think that they're very accurate. Now, look at the Republican Party, one of the two main mainstream parties in the United States. You have 38% who think they're very accurate or somewhat accurate. Uh, only 24% who think that they're somewhat inaccurate. And so we go from, you know, this, uh, we go from, you know, 76% of Americans having never heard of this QAnon conspiracy to January 6, 2021, uh, where this QAnon conspiracy, along with a whole host of other conspiracies and kind of uh, different movements, converge uh, and take over the United States Capitol building. The United States spends $970 billion on defense uh, each year, and within a couple of hours, uh, the, the, the center of the American government is overrun um, and was not protected well in the first place. I mean, I think that's, you know, other governments around the world are, are sort of shocked by how easy it was uh, for the American government uh, to, to, to be, or at least to have the, the Senate building taken over. Now, one thing we'll, we'll sort of talk about this uh, later on, you know, it's a, it was clearly an insurrection, a coup, a putsch, um, all of these terms do apply, an insurrection, sedition, all these things very accurately apply to this. You know, I've studied state failures and government con uh government failures and civil wars and stuff i've you know i'll be talking about that in great detail uh in a couple weeks and this looks like <laughs> what you would see in many different countries around the world now wh what is very interesting though is what exactly were they going to do i mean clearly some of them wanted to go in there and just you know make a bloodbath of uh of american legislators um but for a lot of them, I mean, what exactly, again, what were they going to do? Were they going to start legislating? Um, were they going to seize the means of production and start running the economy? No. Um, it, so, so it was just sort of mob violence, not a really, there's no plan to, you know, take over the Senate and create a new government out of Washington. It's not like the, you know, the guy with the horned, <laughs> with the horns, uh, was going to become, you know, the new king of the Senate or something like this. Um, so very, yeah, very strange, very strange uh, moment. And again, we'll return to the, some of this uh, in the future. But again, this is something that could not have happened uh, before the internet. And obviously the, the, the irony is that, you know, a lot of these people are getting busted because they video recorded themselves and shared it to the world. Um, so, yeah, science, technology, uh, you know, sociologists are going to be researching this in many different ways for many different years to come. So again, you know, how does something like this happen? How do you, how do you, how do you get that? I mean, this goes back to very classic old psychology, sociology. Uh, some of you may read this in social theory. Uh, Gustave Le Bon wrote this book called The Crowd, just kind of looking at mob behavior. He said, the masses have never thirsted after truth. Whoever can supply them with illusions is easily their master. Whoever attempts to destroy their illusions is always their victim. Um, so that is what happens. You know, one of the things that is so frustrating uh, about con conspiracy theories and, and people who adhere to them is that the more that you prove their conspiracy wrong, the more they tend to double down. People tend to do this with any information, like their political views or whatever it might be. Um, it's just that you see this much more dramatically when it comes to conspiracy theories and it's much more it's much more frustrating because there's you know there's a difference between you know an economic argument about liberal conservative policies or something like that and uh, whether or not you know we landed on the moon or you know donald trump is fighting pedophiles in the white house or you know whatever it might be these um when you prove them wrong as i said people unfortunately you know they they're not, they're not going, oh, that's, you're making a logical point there. No, they double down on uh, whatever it is. And, you know, clearly you bought into the propaganda and your mind is controlled and et cetera, et cetera. It can be a very frustrating thing. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, we see that we saw that happen, uh, you know, 
with all the people that went want running into the capital, um, as I said, and as we will learn in the coming months and years, there were many there that were clearly there to kill people. There were others there who were just caught up in the crowd and that were following. And a great example of that was <laughs> just <sighs> when there, there's the, the crowd of, of riders is coming through and there's like the cordoned, uh, the, the room that they're walking through and there's like the velvet, uh, you know, ropes that are cordoned uh, that you're walking through. And, you know, this crowd that had just like beat police and break, broken through windows and stuff, they all walk, you know, quietly and, you know, through the, the, the cordoned, um, areas you know they didn't break those down or anything so again just sort of weird crowd behavior that you saw um in the insurrection okay other things so these algorithms too the a lot of the social media executives and engineers they knew a lot of psychology but they didn't know a lot of history or didn't understand the sort of ways in which uh, history can sort of cycle in and out um because there's been a lot of research now that shows that you know some of these algorithms the way that they've been designed uh can can perpetuate racism because a lot of the initial tech engineers entrepreneurs and so on have been white men and have had uh you know prejudiced views or maybe me or maybe just naive uh views or maybe directly racist views either way the sort of unintended consequences is that now a lot of these algorithms have been designed in a way that is uh, somewhat somewhat racist now kind of going back to surveillance capitalism uh, where am i want to put myself okay over here so essentially Americans, for the most part, don't feel they have a lot of power over um, over the government. So those who have say they have little or no power over the government, you know, eighty over eighty percent. Um, you know, they're more worried about companies uh, gathering data about them and how it's used than 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 governments. Um, it might be different if you were in, say, if you were to ask this question in uh, China or. France or Iran, you know, uh, various different countries may may answer this differently. There's also other problems that we see in social media. Internet trolls. So uh, the trolls are, you know, this uh, people who are likely to, you know, get on and you know, just attack people online and, uh, you know, be provocative and, you know, that sort of thing. Oftentimes for, oftentimes they won't know the person um, and and will get other people to follow in their, their troll armies. So uh, there's another book that looks kind of like this. This is why we can't have nice things, mapping the relationship between online uh, trolling and mainstream culture. Um, <clears throat> when we see on which of the following topics have you seen troll, trolling behavior on the internet? You know, a majority say that they, they've seen trolling in politics, uh, followed by celebrities, then religion, and then uh, news and, and current events. So politics is huge. And that's, in some ways, you know, I'd rather have people trolling about celebrities because it's, uh, you know, people generally don't kill each other or form militias or whatever, um, you know, over, you know, what's going on with Britney Spears or um, uh, Billie Eilish or, or whatever. Um, whereas politics, though, people people become very violent over, over politics. So who are these internet trolls? You know, what are their, their characteristics? Uh, there have been some interesting studies on, done on this. I'll go up here. Uh, so, well, they score high on various characteristics. Machiavellianism, which is, which I'll actually talk about Machiavelli um, in a couple weeks, but this is basically manipulation. Uh, narcissism, thinking you're better than everyone else. Psychopath being psychotic, uh, direct sadism, you know, causing sadism, you know, causing someone else pain and getting joy from that, vicarious sadism, watching pain inflicted on others uh, and getting uh, pleasure from that. So here you see people who are not commenting, they don't score high on those at all. Uh, people who are debating, who, you know, get up and who like to debate online, they tend to score high on some of these. Uh, you know, they score a bit higher on Machiavellianism um, and so on. 
chatting behavior, nothing other than vicarious sadism, interestingly enough. But then look at trolling. Trolling, lots of Machiavellianism, um, lots of psychopathology, lots of sadistic behavior, both direct and vicarious. <clears throat> So trolls are narcissists, they're uh, sadists, uh, and they're psychopaths. So if you've ever thought, you know, trolls seem kind of psychotic, you're somewhat right. If you think that they enjoy, get joy from suffering, you're right. I was supposed to give a talk at Oxford last summer, Oxford University, yes, um, about this, about what I called algorithmic aggression, about this new sort of aggression that we're seeing where, uh, you know, you can get these troll armies sort of form and they can attack people. And it doesn't count as violence in the way that we think of violence today, because it's not like there's a crowd of people that are, you know, physically attacking someone they're, you know, maybe emotionally attacking them online. But we're learning more and more that that does have an effect that, you know, these sort of like, you know, that affects your, 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 um, the chemistry in your brain, uh, your hormonal balances, and so on. And so I was making the argument that we need to start thinking about that more in terms of violence like we do in, uh, you know, physical violence. And that's, this is, a, again, something that's totally because of the internet. You know, it can't happen without, uh, without the internet. You know, cyberbullying, another big big problem, a uh, contemporary problem with the internet. Uh, if you look at where it's most prevalent, interestingly, India. You know, why, I don't know. Maybe the uh, the drastic inequalities, maybe um, resi residue from the caste system. I'm not sure, actually. Uh, Brazil, followed by Brazil, and then followed by the United States, and then South Africa. Again, you know, why exactly? I, I, I can't say for certain, so uh, maybe I shouldn't even speculate. Um, in terms of who's doing this in this in this study uh, a lot of it girls and boys are you know doing it roughly equally until you get to you know some things name calling and bullying cyber whoops cyber bullying not a big difference between boys and girls spreading false rumors way more girls doing this uh receiving receiving explicit images they didn't ask for no surprise there that girls are doing it probably from boys getting questions about their activities or their whereabouts, girls, physical threats, about equal, interestingly, uh, explicit images of them shared without consent, girls more than, uh, more than boys. Cyberbullying in general, <clears throat> I know it's in this survey, it's the same. I've seen other research that show uh, girls experiencing and taking part in far more cyberbullying than boys. Teenage boys are you know, they're online on social media too. Some of them are cyberbullying, but they're playing more video games, whereas uh, girls are spending more time on uh, social media. And social media opens up the, the opportunity for, <coughs> for uh, cyberbullying. Now, we see a, a huge change in depression rates. About 2009, 2010, you see this sharp divergence where girls start to start to jump in terms of uh, of depression depression rates you see also that you know since suicide rates for teenage boys up to about 25 percent since the first decade of this century but for girls it's up 70 percent it's up 70 percent since 2001 to 2010. that means that you know like my experience growing up uh, in in high school in the 1990s or even when I was in college in the 2000s, you know, the, the friends that I had and, and girlfriends and so on, you know, they, their experience was, has to have been much different than, than yours, <laughs> uh, the girls who are in this class and girls who are teenagers right now, uh, because there was not nearly this level of depression uh, felt by girls. And perhaps that's why um, you're seeing, you know, the success of artists like uh, Billie Eilish and uh, Phoebe Bridgers, you know, these female artists that uh, kind of focus on, um, on, on, on depression, um, as well as Lizzo, who's uh, focuses on sort of body, you know, kind of um, uh, body appreciation and things like this, all of these things that uh, girls have had to struggle with much more than boys. 
No, <clears throat> some more charts. Um, hospital admissions for non-fatal self-harm, so you know, self-mutilation. Got three different age groups. The blue is age 10 to 14, black age 15 to 19, green age 20 to 24. No big changes from 20, 2001 to 2015. You know, you know, no, you know, the trend is basically the same. Now, this is boys. Now, I want you to, you know, keep this in your mind and then watch girls. Now, especially watch the rate of self harm, of hospital admissions for self harm amongst girls age 10 to 14. So prepubescent to uh, early uh, puberty. You have, first of all, girls in their late teen years, you have a jump of 62% in hospital admission since 2009, 17% uh, for girls roughly your age. Um, and then, as I said, for, for girls age 10 to 14, so, you know, early, early adolescence, preteen, early adolescence, up 189%. I mean, that is just, that's heartbreaking. And we see the the years, you know, so what is it that's going on here? If we, we remember that the depression rates started going up here as well. Um, <clears throat> I'll ask students this, you know, what's going on here? Often students will always say social media. And yes, that's, a, <laughs> that's like 70% of it or something. Um, but social media has been around since 2001 or so. So uh, why is it that you get 2009, 2010, uh, that this really starts changing? What's going on that happens here? The smartphone, the smartphone, it comes out in 2007. Uh, by 2009, 2010, everyone is taking selfies of each other, uh, sharing them. <clears throat> comparing it themselves to others and uh you know for girls this has to be tr horrible i mean the amount of pressure that have, that has always been put on girls to uh look a, a certain way or or whatever now you're you know literally competing with you know your best friends and um you know taking hundreds of pictures to find one perfect one uh and so on and so forth all of this is bad for anxiety all of this is bad for you know mental health we know that being on just being on your phone for a long time isn't good for you so you know trying to being on your phone, trying to focus on your looks and everything like that, uh, it can't be good either. So we have a big crisis in this country, and not just this country, this is happening around the world with girls, young girls and technology. And really, it's not, you know, the technology and girls neutral. <laughs> um, it's our society, the expectations uh, for for beauty, mainly, th that we place upon women. That's what's driving uh, so many <clears throat> of these young girls and women into despair. And the question is, you know, what, what's going to happen when they grow up? And now, you know, where the girls who are in this class are, <clears throat> excuse me, are girls who have fallen into uh, this time period, who, you know, can, came of age during this time period. Uh, so maybe you recognize this, uh, or maybe, you know, boys and, you know, girls you've known, or sisters or girlfriends, or whatever it might be. So we live in this, this, this strange age, as I said, um, where we have this new system of instrumentarianism, uh, surveillance, capitalism, and so on. We have all these different social media things to connect us to everyone. Um, and we also have, you know, different groups that are competing for how reality is interpreted around the world. Um, and we're all sort of carving out different pieces of it. We also have more surveillance with, uh, coronavirus and so on will probably see more digital surveillance. QAnon is probably just the beginning of uh, many, many sort of online cults and movements. And I'll talk about QAnon in great detail, as I said, uh, in a future, future lecture. Next week, so as I said, next week we're kind of, we, there's no, we're still stick, sticking with science and technology. Lectures might be a little bit shorter. <clears throat> um, and I'm going to talk about some uh, new philosophies about uh, about the digital age and, and, and so on. And it will kind of be a way in which to segue from technology to war and terrorism, which are all uh, very linked together. So whatever you got from these lectures on the on the internet, um, on on uh, you know social media and so on, whether you 
like it or don't like it, the one thing I, you know, I would uh, recommend is no matter what, make sure you do shoulder exercises because um, that's the other thing that's kind of interesting over the coming years, we're going to need a lot more massage therapists and uh, physical therapists because we'll have had a couple, a few generations now have been hunched over, you know, like this, looking at phones and laptops and, um, you know, we, we have not evolved to do that. So uh, anyway, just make sure you do your exercises and everything. So uh, do that this weekend and I will see you on Monday.